today we're here with William Egnatoff, who's had a long career in music and an amazing journey. And we're going to go back to the beginning. Let's talk about your childhood. How did you get involved in music in the first place? I was born in Melfort, Saskatchewan. And, of course, they had a band there. And I was involved. We, were, uh, we attended the United Church there. And, of course, I was, from early days, singing in the junior choir. Bernice McCosh was the director and I got some lessons from her and sang in the festival. And then when I was about seven and a half I started on the flute. And the way that happened is that there was a band in Melford, an adult band and, the, and so on, but the, they didn't have a director at that time. They were missing a director. And along had come uh, a German bricklayer. He wasn't really a bricklayer, but he, you have to have a trade to get in. He was actually a trained bandmaster, and they quickly found that out and said, would you run the band? Okay, so he, he said yes. And then, uh, you need players. You need to recruit. And where do you go for that? You go to the school prince, the elementary school principal. My father was supervising principal of the two and then three elementary schools there. And, uh, well, we need flute players. What's a flute? And how much does it cost? So that's how it happened. And I started with Dietrich Weigel then in Melford, seven and a half. Played in the festival. One of my first adjudicators was Lyle Gustin. And he's a big part of Saskatoon's musical history. Was your family musical at all? Um, well, Mum played the piano, and we did have a piano. Um, Dad had played the violin a little bit, I think, in his boyhood, but he, he grew up on a, on a homestead farm in, outside of Saskatoon. So there wasn't a lot of opportunity for, for music there, but uh, they were certainly encouraged me all the way through. They were big supporters. Then in 58 we moved to Saskatoon. So was the flute something you remembered that it was something you did want to do or just something it was suggested? And well it came to me and I liked it so I stuck with it. And had you, did you eventually also in the school years try other instruments? I didn't. I did get some piano lessons. I didn't get very far with that and a little bit of harmony and other things but did you do any church choirs? Anything like that? Oh, I've sung in church choirs almost all my life, and other choirs. Yeah. Okay, so you came to Saskatoon. How old were you? Well, it was 1958, so I was I turned 11 after we got here. Yeah. Okay. So what school did you go to here? We went to I went to John Lake Public School, which would have been pretty new at that time. It was quite new at that time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and. In Malford, we were ahead of the game, so it wasn't terribly interesting. So, um, started out in grade six, and then the last two months I did grade seven, and the next year I went into grade eight. Oh, that's pretty handy. And was there any type of music program at all at John Lake? I don't remember any. Okay, so we had you're... Rita Spencer was the was a teacher and. She had established the John Lake Civic League. I remember being part of that. But and were you taking private flute lessons all this time? My teacher then was um, James Bolton, and he was a graduate student in photochemistry who played the flute and taught flute. So okay. he got me along for, for a few years. Do you remember the first concerts he would have ever played? Well, I guess those would have been band concerts in Melfort. Okay. And then I don't... That school band or with the adults? With, well, it was... I was a... I think it was a mixed group then, with all the, the younger flutists that, that had been okay. recruited by this new band director. Right. Yeah. Okay. And where did you go to high school? Aiden Bowman. Aiden Bowman. Okay. And at that time, did you think music was going to be your career? I, I, I thought I wanted to, 
Well, I got interested, once I got into the senior years, interested in physics, and that was, I fell in love with that right away, and I, that was going to be my career, but I wanted to always keep up the music. And the first year of high school, I actually wasn't at ABCI, because that's when, that was 6061, when we went to Nigeria. It was the Nigerian independence. They had made uh, primary education compulsory, and they needed teachers desperately, and so they needed help with teacher education, and that's what my dad was there for, so he took us. And uh, I continued my flute playing there. Actually, I continued some lessons with James Bolton by tape recording them and shipping them back and forth. I think I still have some of those tapes. And there were some wonderful pianists there that we connected with. One was a retired major, and the other was a very fine uh, classical pianist. Uh, so I had some good coaching from them. And did you get to do much playing in Nigeria? Well, a little bit. I mean, and uh, the major sometimes had little sort of musical soirees at his house. And, um, okay. Yeah, a little bit of opportunity. So at that time, were you shy or outgoing as a person? Well, I was, I was comfortable playing in public. I'd been singing and playing in public okay. for quite a few years by then. Right. So okay. good. And so you were there for the year, and then you come back. Yes. And then you go to Aiden Bowman. Aiden and Bowman. Much of a music department there at that time. No. Um, the guidance counselor had a little band, and sometimes I played in that. And then there came a time when she wasn't going to lead it anymore, and so I offered, <laughs> but I wasn't qualified. The principal was not one to uh, give opportunities to <laughs> to someone who wasn't properly qualified and trained in music theory and whatever. So, um, but that was one of the very few times when um, an opportunity that would have been good for me what, where a door wasn't open because uh, mm -hmm. from, from the time we moved to Saskatoon there were just many, many doors open. And I think I started teaching flute then and also when we came back from Nigeria, I was 14, and I started playing in the Saskatoon Symphony. I could have played in the youth orchestra then, right. but I wanted the, to play in the, the big orchestra, right. the senior one. In the 60s, did the symphony have any rules or regulations about teenagers being in the group? Well, that was interesting. If They, they had an arrangement with the Saskatoon Musicians Union okay. that uh, if you were going to be paid, you had to be a member of the union. Right. So I actually joined the union at age 14, but I had to get my parents to sign my papers. Right. So Skip Katz had also joined at a young age. Do you yeah. remember any other teenage members? Mm, I don't remember. There may have well have been. Um, Alexander Reisman was the conductor at that time. And he would go on and on. Rehearsals would go on, I don't know, to 11 or after, and my parents would come to pick me up at 10 o'clock. And so, so there was always a bit of a joke about that. Oh, he has to go home and he has to get to bed now. And were you a natural in terms of they'd hand you the music and you're like, okay, I'm ready to play this? Or was this a lot of work practicing on your own? Well, it was some, but no, it wasn't. And then, I, of course, I wasn't. I was playing sort of assistant or third flute or whatever. Right. So. Would there have been a lot of flute players at the time? There were quite a few, and uh, and of course James Bolton had quite a few students. And, but there was another interesting person who came into my life probably in '62, and that was Ed Abramson. Now he was a professor of sociology, and a very interesting fellow. But he had started out in music and had studied with the, the great William King Cade for a year at Curtis in Philadelphia. So and then he decided, I guess, that music wasn't going to be sufficiently intellectually challenging for him. And uh, so he went on into sociology. But he did get enough from King Cade, I think, to, to 
provide us with quite a foundation. And there were a lot of uh, his students who, many of whom were in studying in other fields, but, but he really got them going and we'd, he'd get us playing trios and quartets and really getting into the interpretation of music and bringing some of the elements of what's known as the Philadelphia School into, into our approach to music. So he, he gave us a foundation of, of interpretive musical language. You also, at that time, were in the boys' choir? I was in the Saskatoon Boys' Choir. I don't have the, the years exactly in my, in my head, but uh, I think probably only two years. I also, actually, I also played, when we first came, I also um, played in the, uh, the Lions Band, the A Band. And I've okay. just remembered that now, actually. So we did some marching and concert work there. And uh, how many flute players in that group? Probably. I don't remember. Probably quite a few. I think Michael Kalmakoff was the director. I just remember that right. name now. I think I've got that correct. Does that ring a bell? Yeah. Yeah. Was there a big difference between the A and B bands? I don't think I played in the B band, but there there was a fair difference. Yeah, I I just played in the A band. And so the A band, I presume, being the better band, would get yeah. the majority of events, or do you think? I don't at that remember. Time? I don't remember anything about concerts. Oh, yeah. I, I just remember a bit about marching. I remember the lyre that I had, which had a silver-plated piece on it, and then this heavy strap around it, and this clip shaped in the form of it. Where did the boys' choir do most of their concerts? That would have been in Knox United Church, where Don Forbes, the director, was the organist. And where the Lions Band have done most of theirs. I have vague recollection of a high school gymnasium, which might have been City Park. Okay. I think that's where we practiced. And the symphony at that time was at the university? Yes, we practiced in Convocation Hall and some concerts there, but then uh, for bigger events we would, we would have our concerts in the gym especially if the choral, for the big choral concerts. Mm -hmm. Do you remember any uh, problems with that room? How was the sound <laughs> and all that? Well, it's a gymnasium, mm -hmm. but that's where we went. And of course, the Centennial Auditorium, that was a huge event, but that's yes. a little bit later. Do you remember doing any shows at the Capitol Theatre? I do. I don't remember any particular events there, but... Yeah, we certainly played at the Capitol. Do you remember, was the Capitol Theater, was the stage big enough to hold the symphony? Because they didn't we seem to play there, but I'm curious why no. they didn't. We managed, I guess. But... Yeah. Okay, so you were involved with the Boys Choir. They released their first album, Christmas of 1962. Yeah. And you sang and played flute I on it? I sang on that, and then I played flute in at least one number. Of it, so. I'll have to go back home now and listen to it and see, but I remember Sheep May Safely Graze, which played the, right. one of the flute parts in that, you know. And so as a teenager, who were some of your best musical friends that you hung out with? Oh, I think the close musical friends really, well, they were Abramson students. So Avril Arneson, she was a biologist, she went off to Paris, actually she became really quite Parisian. <laughs> And her um, her sister played trombone, uh, um, Stephanie. Um, one person who became a close friend later on uh, was Al Nicholson. And Al was in engineering physics at the time, and so he and Donnie Bedford, who played trumpet, Al played trombone and piano, and um, they were... Uh, teaching assistants when I was in my undergraduate physics days. And Al was just a natural musician, amazing musician. Um, let's see, who else? Um, Ken, Ken Gordon played the flute. He was and uh, a very dear friend of mine, who became a very dear friend of mine, Dennis Esser, played the oboe. And uh, we became lifelong friends. He introduced me to a friend of his, Richard Bernie Smith, 
who was a, um, an Anglican church organist in Saskatoon and later moved to Dundas, Ontario. So when I did my grad school at Toronto, I ended up connecting with Richard and getting interested in early music, Baroque music, and playing in his Te Deum concert. So there are just many, many connections. Right, right. And Al Nicholson, he was doing engineering physics, but at one point he decided he'd, uh, he'd like to study composition. So he spent a weekend writing some music, right. got into a master's of composition at Berkeley. And that's the kind of guy he was. But he wrote a jazz mass, and he invited me to play in that. So I'm not a natural jazz musician, but I do love jazz, and, and I still want to move more in that direction. What year did you graduate high school? I graduated in 64 and then I did my undergraduate degree here and let's see there and were, you were getting 60 a degree in in, in physics. physics yeah All right, so I did my honors physics and but I had gotten interested in composition a little bit and Murray had asked and actually opened doors for me. he actually let me take two composition classes from him without the normal background that a composer really ought to have in terms of musical foundation. And that led to some interesting opportunities, um, including a centennial one. Uh, the Winnipeg Symphony with Victor Felbrill had a special project, centennial project, which was to uh, pick uh, one young composer from each of the four western provinces and uh, have them write an orchestral piece and then they would rehearse and perform it and we had a week with or four days with Harry Somers so that was a really amazing opportunity and I had also 63, 64, 65, 66 I'd spent four summers in the National Youth Orchestra so it was very much very much Ed Abramson who really gave me the foundation I needed to get to get into that and that was a great opportunity from that I mean I, I there are people all across the country that I know still from that those four years right yeah. did you ever at that time think well I'm sure glad I'm playing the flute and because uh, I travel with the double bass <laughs> with the double bass I don't know I just never thought about wanting to play any other instrument. That's the one that I started with and it yeah. was great for me. And how did you find that first when you got into composing and having to write and arrange for all the other instruments? Well, it's a challenge, but of course, when I knew them from my orchestral experience, and you just you have to learn how to mm -hmm. orchestrate and how to write for them and get friends to try things out. Did you play in any uh, university-related music groups? Mm, when I was an undergraduate, no. It was mainly the, the, symph the symphony was the big thing, and then I was just busy practicing whenever I could. And I, and I took a full load of classes, and the composition classes were extra, so it was a very busy time. And I was teaching flute, so there wasn't time for a lot, <laughs> a lot else, really. How many students would you have taken on? That, as an undergraduate, I'd have to look back at my, my records. I'm sure I had more than a dozen. But later, when I came back to Saskatoon, that was another, that was another matter. So. Okay. So, we're now, we're still in the late 60s, yeah. and you get your first degree right. here. Yes. Okay. And then, and then what happened? Well, I had really gotten interested in high energy physics and applied to three schools and was accepted at all of them and decided to go to Toronto to work with a mathematical physicist, uh, Bill Sharp. So when I was there, of course, my flute went with me. And in fact, it was while I was there that I got my first really fine professional flute. I had a good flute that I had gotten on our way to Nigeria in 1960, it was a silver flute, but my Powell flute, which I still have, um, I got it in 1969, after waiting three years for it to be made. 
And then uh, my, when I was there, I played one year in, with Boris Brott, his first year of the Hamilton Philharmonic. I played second flute there. And uh, then I got connected with Richard Bernie Smith, as I mentioned. So that, but that was a Saskatoon connection through my undergraduate buddy who became a close friend. And, uh, and uh, that, so that door opened up to, to get into, involved with Baroque music. Okay. Before we leave the 60s, let's talk about the symphony a little bit more at okay. that time. Do you have any highlight memories, anything that stands out? Well, it was just a great experience, and gradually, as you played in it longer, you got more opportunity. And, and uh, sometimes I may have played first, but mostly Abramson had the students who were a little ahead of me, and um, so I would play second. I, I think I played I played some piccolo. Um, the so after Alexander Reisman left, and David Kaplan was, became the conductor, and, and he again was another one who really opened up the doors for me later when I came back. So the sixties, yeah, it was mainly just a regular member of the of the symphony and playing in festivals, of course, and the National Youth Orchestra. So, how much time did this kind of consume your life? the flute part of your journey as opposed to physics and... Well, then, as much time as I could fit in, and uh, sometimes it got set aside, but I, but I had to keep it up. And of course, in the summers with the youth orchestra, there were times when we'd be playing 11 hours a day. It was really intensive. So that's where I really made progress. All right, so the 70s come, you're, you leave Saskatoon. In, yeah, 68, I left Saskatoon. Okay. So tell us So then about I that. was in Toronto doing graduate school, master's, and then doctorate in physics for three years. And as I said, doing the music that I did there was the one year with the Hamilton Philharmonic and then the concerts with Richard Bernie Smith. I don't remember doing much else other than just practicing. And then, um, of course, if I'd come home, I would play, and I always played in, in church as part of worship and so on. Um, then I went off to Switzerland and taught in a private school, taught physics and math and a bit of chemistry. And I kept playing the flute. I think there were a few people in the school who had, they were all kids from Ontario, mostly. And it was a grade 13, grade, grade 12, 13 school. How did Canadian, you, how did you land up in Switzerland? Uh, I, I thought towards the end of my third year of grad school that I, maybe I should start looking, keeping my eye open for possible positions. I saw a little piece of yellow typewriter paper on a bulletin board. It said, Canadian Junior College teacher. <laughs> well, I'll apply for that. Then I got the job, which was a good opportunity, but on the other hand, in terms of going on in a, for a career in physics, it meant two years interrupted my, interrupting my doctoral studies, and, and so I ended up not really going on in physics once I got my doctorate, because you really had to stay in the loop and stay close to what was going on if you wanted to get a postdoc position and then a right. university position somewhere. And in Switzerland, English was no problem? Well, the school was in English, so I taught in an English bubble, and the rest of my life was in French, which was mm. fine. Okay. Actually, ended up connecting with a, a woman who was a singer. Who, she was actually a lab tech, but she sang in a professional group with the uh, Ensemble Instrumental et Vocal de Lausanne. And Michel, Michel Corbeau was the conductor, quite a famous Swiss conductor. So I actually got to attend some of their rehearsals. But I did a little bit of work with her in... Uh, in the, in the church, but not much really music making there. And then in the middle of those two years, I came back to connect with my supervisor, continue the thesis, and went to make an appointment. He said, oh, didn't you hear? Dr. Sharp was killed in a climbing accident. Well, I didn't even know he was a climber. Mm -hmm. So 
Yeah. After that, I said, mm, nobody else understands my work. I'll just get someone who will be my supervisor in name, and I'll come back to Saskatoon. So that started another chapter. That was 73 to 80. And in that time, that was a very intensive musical time. That's the way I earned my living. Hmm. And then? And then, okay. <laughs> well, then, that was a really an interesting, interesting time. Um, of course, the one thing I left out, I guess, of the... Uh, of the from the the 60s was the move in 67 to the Centennial Auditorium. That was a big move, and that was a move to back-to-back uh, -back concerts. And we were filling that hall, maybe not quite twice, but it, once completely. And then the second hall, the second concert was pretty full as well. So that was a huge leap for the for the symphony, and I believe that Dwayne Nelson was conducting then. So then, by then I was principal, okay. I believe, and then when I went away, then Randy Nelson became principal flute, and then uh, I think, and I'm a little fuzzy on that, but anyway, when I came back, then I started up again, just playing whatever they needed. Um, and Dwayne Nelson was the symphony and his responsibilities in music education um, at the university were getting to be too big. And so he felt it was time for, um, for the organization to find a um, a conductor from outside and but in transition towards that I had become an assistant for, to Duane and he gave me the opportunity to do some rehearsing with the orchestra and then actually um, I think for half a season I became sort of acting music director or and that was a, an amazing opportunity and actually Duane the piece that I had written for the Harry Sommers workshop in the Centennial, then um, later um, Dwayne, um, Dwayne had put it on our program and uh, revised it, added more percussion because we had a huge percussion section. <laughs> and uh, so that was a great, great opportunity. And of course, Dwayne had been influenced by the the Sato conducting method, and of course Wayne Toes really got into that in a big way and became a major proponent of that school of conducting and wrote about it and developed materials and so on. But um, so that was that gave me a foundation in in conducting, and, uh, and also I was on the board, and I'd been involved in directing the summer orchestra workshop for four summers. And I've just forgotten which summers though was the word then. Um, the, I jotted these things down here. 63. Do, do, do. Um, I'd have to check. I'll check that and I'll, I'll give you that information. Okay. Let's see. South Dune Symphony, yeah, 63 to 68, and then. 66 to 68, I was principal, I think. Yeah. And then... Yeah, um, How did the symphony decide for each season what music was going to be performed? Oh, that was always the, the music directors. Yeah, no, the music director always... And that's always the way it is with orchestras, I think. Or, conductors do not like <laughs> committees. Um, saying what they should be playing. So, so no. if the music director is picking, does the conductor have say? Yeah, well, the, conduct, the music director is the conductor. Oh, that's what you mean. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. I see. Yeah. So, and so, tell me a little bit about um, if a new season was coming, but what's the biggest challenges that you have 
because the symphony likes to bring in guests yes. for each concert. Well, yeah, you have to have, for most concerts, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and of course the symphony, eternally, being in the arts, has always had financial issues. Yeah. And uh, that never changes. And attendance, of course, is always an issue. Yeah. And yes, it, I agree that the, there was a big boom when the Centennial opened. Yeah. That was a pretty exciting time. Yeah. Do you think that um, that actually brought more people out? In terms I th of oh, people oh, who I think, never had. I think it. I think it did. And and of course, we also got into hiring a manager at that time. And uh, so there was, there was um, Ray Keeler was I think the first manager. And again, that was Dwayne's doing. And he initiated a lot of things. He established. Um, artist in residence positions in the symphony so that was a big boost and the idea was that you get young professionals who would come in and maybe stay for a few years or whatever they would have a principal position in the symphony they might have a sessional appointment at the university they would do private teaching any freelance work that they could and they'd get their careers established and um, in our woodwind quintet I think a great example of that was James Mason the oboist um, and he's become a very distinguished oboist. He's, he's made a, really a fine career um, as soloist, as a, a chamber musician. And, uh, Do you remember uh, the symphony with you doing any, say, CBC radio broadcasts, things like that? We... Oh, you just reminded me of something else. But I, there were some broadcasts, sure. But we also... Um, there were some opportunities, and this would have been back in the 60s, to ha have a Saskatchewan orchestra. So we'd go to Regina and we'd combine forces and they, they'd come here. And, right. yeah, and I remember some of the bus trips and some of the things that musicians do in bus trips. Yeah. <laughs> that was, so that was kind of fun. And um, um, so there was, of course, there's always this rivalry between Saskatoon and Regina, I suppose that continues to this day, but there was also some fine collaboration between the, uh, between the musicians in the two cities. Do you remember the Mardi Gras balls? Oh, why? You reminded me, <laughs> yeah. So we would play Strauss waltzes, and, and that was always fun, and they're, of course, they are beautifully orchestrated, and we wouldn't rehearse them a lot, but uh, Alex Reisman was great with that. I remember he, he really got us into that. What other main things did the symphony do besides that? Well, school concerts. That was very important. And I don't remember going out to the schools, but certainly we would have students come in. And once the Centennial Auditorium was open, then they would, they would come in there. So before the Centennial, where did the symphony rehearse? Mostly you say convocation in hall. Convocation okay. Hall, yeah, in Convocation Hall. And so the reason to hold it though in the gym was just because it held more people? Yeah, for the concerts that were larger ones. If we were doing a major choral work with the choral society, then... then uh, were you involved with any events uh, related to Expo 67? Well, I was actually, because of my uh, work with Maria Daskin, I heard about um, an event uh, with Elliot Carter and the Minneapolis Symphony. They were um, they were premiering his piano concerto, which was quite an amazing work. Um, and he, there was also an opportunity for young composers to uh, apply and go to uh, basically a seminar with him and take our scores, recordings if we had them. So we got to have four days with Elliot Carter, which was really amazing. And I think Carter is probably, you know, without doubt, one of the, one of the greatest uh, and most influential American composers of the 20th and into the 21st century. I mean, he was still, still writing when he died at age, I think, 104. So, so that was quite an opportunity, and he was encouraging. 
he listened to the recording of the piece that I had written and and uh, I didn't go on really much in composition and but that's part of what I'm still hoping to do right. to do more writing but again it was it was Adaskin and others who provided the opportunity right. and would let people take risks and bend the rules a little bit to open doors for them. Okay, let's jump back forward again. So okay. you, you came back to Saskatoon, that was in... 73. 73. Okay. So then got involved right away in the symphony. And uh, I think it wasn't right away, but it had been 74, then David Kaplan um, uh, in, invited me to apply to teach flute at at the university. So I did that for six years and that was wonderful. And in that time, so that was really a very, very active time. I had built up a, a private studio. I think at one point I probably had 40, 40 flute students. I had all the flute majors and minors then for those six years. And then uh, lots of chamber music. We had a woodwind quintet, which was great. We, I remember doing a tour to some nor northern communities, northern Saskatchewan. Uh, the Range was one of the places where we played, and uh, we'd do school concerts, um, co uh, directing the summer orchestra workshop, and uh, there were wonderful young musicians who were the coaches in that. Is that at Fort Capel? No, that was right here. We, well, I think it was pretty well, we used the Castle Theatre yeah. at Aiden Woolman for that when I was involved. Jack Johnson had been involved with it, and was then, and um, yeah, so I think I, I think I looked after the flutes once or twice, and then Jack did the conducting, and then I took over the conducting for a, a few years, I think, two or three years, and, and, and running the show and got others involved. Mm -hmm. Patricia Green was one of them. She was a flute major, and she went off and to England, studied with William Bennett, who was really one of the major, major flute figures in the classical flute world, in, in the world, I guess. And um, then she actually ended up becoming a singer, and she's head of voice at Western. But I've reconnected with her on, on occasion, but she was one of my, one of my finest flute majors. That's good. Then, as you, you reminded me about our Three to Get Ready trio that we had through the Saskatchewan Junior Concerts uh, Society. I applied for that with uh, Mary Lou Colbinson, Mary Lou Dawes, and, uh, and Dorothy Howard, so contralto, piano, and flute. We put together a program that, of Canadian music. Um, we, we arranged some Canadian folk songs. We, um, got the uh, Mendel Art Gallery to uh, duplicate some group of seven slides that would, <laughs> we had a little slideshow that would go along with these. And that was a lot of fun. We did 43 school concerts throughout the province that year. So that was a pretty busy year. And then several times in that period, two or probably three times, Robert Aitken came. And once I actually with funding that Kaplan helped to provide through the university. We brought him here to work with my students. Um, we actually made a video, um, an hour-long video of his teaching, and, uh, and then he gave a recital with, with Mary Lou Dawes accompanying him. I played a couple of pieces with him, so that was... Uh, I had connected with him first probably when I was in the in, in doing my grad work in Toronto. And now I have a very close relationship with him. I'm actually uh, documenting his teaching and uh, writing a biography on him. But again, the foundation for that was really laid here in Saskatoon. So now we come to the 80s. The 80s. I guess it, I felt it was time to regroup in my life. I was going in too many directions, and I thought, well, since I haven't gotten a job in physics, 
I've moved away from that. Um, maybe I should get my teaching qualification, which I did, while I was still doing all this other work. So it was a very busy year, but I, I got my professional A certificate through a, a year of uh, College of Education courses, and then taught in uh, North Battleford for two years. Um, there was a, uh, um, a grade 9, 10 science position there, with a little bit of music. And Bob Latimer, Robert Latimer, was the band teacher there. He was, he was a major figure in music education in the province. Um, and then the next year, he went to the Ministry of Education to do some curriculum work. And so all of a sudden, then all the band work opened up, and, and they asked me to do that. And that was a big challenge, and not my cup of tea, even though we had some fine moments. But uh, then I decided, then I'm not cut out for this. <laughs> but meanwhile, I'd gotten quite interested in, the, in those in my uh, Bachelor of Education year and in those two years of teaching of using computers for, for learning. So I thought, oh, I'm going to do some graduate studies in that area. I went out to UBC and then from there I got my job at Queen's. So I was in teacher education at Queen's for 29 years from 84 to 2013, um, doing computers and education, including some international work, keeping up the music. Yeah. Chamber music and singing in choirs. And, right. So tell so us of some of the highlights of this lengthy part of your life. I guess just making music with wonderful people. Yeah. I mean, the, the trio, the woodwind quintet, the symphony. Um, uh, Kaplan was just a great supporter. I had written a duo, actually, well, my father was a great supporter, and somehow he got the idea, maybe it was a centennial. No, there was something, some event in Rotary. They commissioned me to write a piece, so I wrote a duo for, a very challenging duo actually for, it was my first sort of fully 12-tone piece and it used sort of rhythmical modulation ideas from, that I'd gotten from Elliot Carter. And, uh, but Kaplan was the only one whom I've ever played it with. He was willing to learn it. And uh, so he was a great, he was a great encourager and supporter and opportunity provider. And of course, many, many people were benefited from Dwayne Nelson's leadership. He was just a, a great friend and mentor to many people and, and again provided wonderful opportunities for me and the orchestra in conducting and mm -hmm. the woodwind quintet. So those are things that kept me going in music and now basically it's music the rest of the way. And uh, If you look at your entire life, is there one concert that stands out as, you know, the important one or the favorite one? Oh, there were so many. I mean, I... I of course, the, the, the recital that Aiken gave here and playing with him, that was great. Um, there are many. I had two opportunities to work with a guitarist. Uh, there was, there was a guitarist, a classical guitarist, in um, here in for a while at the university when I in the 70s, and we did some work together. And then when I moved to Kingston, um, I found another classical guitarist who I think he had done his his master's at Yale, very fine musician, and uh, we actually, because of travels west, ended up giving a recital in Saskatoon. Um, so that work was a highlight. Um, when we were here in the 60s through, with Ed Abramson, the sociolog musician turned sociologist, he was very close closely associated with close friends to um, Garth Beckett and Boyd MacDonald, who had an amazing duo, piano duo. And I had the opportunity to, to uh, play with both of them. So there were many, many highlights. Mm -hmm. In the symphony, when, when, um, when I had, uh, was doing some conducting, when Dwayne Nelson was uh, 
was uh, phasing out his involvement with the symphony. We were supposed to have Arthur Fiedler as a guest conductor, but he was at a point where his health was a little bit on the edge and he didn't come. So uh, Mel Carey and I were, <laughs> we were Arthur Fiedler. We had, to, we conducted the that mm -hmm. concert. So that was fun. That's cool. And, uh, yeah. mm. Tell me a bit about personal life, family, hobbies, interests. Well, as a, as a boy, I got, I actually had my ham radio ticket when I was just I think 15 or something like that, and I had a rig for a year, which I'd bought from the trombonist Al Nicholson, whom I mentioned. And then after a year I said, this is fun, but I don't have enough time for music, so I sold the rig. So that was, but I had that little interest in electronics. And um, of course, I love making things and doing house renovations and stuff like that. And plumbing and wiring and all those sorts of things. And, but, and cycling. Got into cycling when I was in Switzerland. Joined a club, did a bit of racing. And still cycle just to get around mostly. Mm -hmm. um, but music is the, is the big thing. I've been involved in, well I mentioned that my father founded a rotary club when we were in Nigeria and he was heavily involved in rotary. He joined rotary when, in the year I was born. And I actually didn't join Rotary until about six months, six or seven months before he died. Mm -hmm. So, so that's been an influence, and when was I'm that? still involved. And that was in uh, 2005. I joined in January. He died in August. Mm -hmm. So he knew that I was a Rotarian <laughs> before yeah, he died. Good. Yeah. Let's talk about your dad a little bit. What's kind of highlights of his career? Oh well, he was. He was a very public figure. I mean, he was involved as a you know, one room from a one room school teacher to being a, an elementary school principal, then involved in teacher education, educational administration. Uh, he was involved in politics, as I mentioned. He was an MLA. I remember licking stamps for his mm -hmm. <laughs> campaign back. At, he was an MLA from fifty two to fifty six, I think, just one term. Mm -hmm. And through redistribution. He, he didn't luck out the next time. Um, very much involved, as I said, in public service and Rotarian, involved in the, in the church in a variety of ways as a deacon and lay leader. And, um, very much interested in youth. He was involved with the Forum for Young Canadians for many years. Of course, involved in educational administration organizations. Um, he was a school trustee for 20 years uh, in Saskatoon and a third chair of the Saskatoon Public School Board for 13 of those years. Um, he was there any main things that he was personally pushing, trying to achieve? Well, I need, I mean, I'm, at some point I'll write the biography of him. I've, I've, uh, we've archived um, 33 meters of his papers in the Saskatchewan Archives Board, including 20 years of school board files. Um, I'm trying to think of things that happened when he was, I think the, uh, there was a bit of a community schools movement that trying to recapture some of the things that happened in a one-room school in, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the, the way schools are were developing, I think uh, the kinds of special programs for um, the adaptive programs for people with special needs that was important. Um, yeah, and I think he certainly he re regretted the, the the gradual erosion of of the local local authority of the school board because he felt that that was that sort of public, direct public involvement through trustees was very, very important to make sure that the school system was adapted to well to the community. But he was, he was a very good. He had strong ideas, um, which he would express. But 
he really knew how to both and in rotary as well how to work with committees and make sure you had strong leadership in the committees and get them to go out and do their homework and come back and make their recommendations and then he would support that even if he thought something different himself he wouldn't try to use his power to to steer away he would say you know you've done your work you we gave you your mandate you've reported back Mm -hmm. Let's act on your recommendations. So it was a style of leadership. I think maybe I, I, by osmosis, learned a few, quite a few things from him. And then he was on the National Parole Board for quite a few years. He did quite a bit of labor negotiation. You know, just involved in community and serving community and trying to make this country a better place. He really wanted to be a senator and uh, that he wasn't appointed to Senate, that was, that was a disappointment, I think, but that's do you, do you have any siblings? I have a sister. She lives in Winnipeg, yeah. Okay. She's... Any sick at all? She's, her artistic interest, she, well, she did play, the, I think, the violin a little bit and a little bit of piano, but her artistic interests are more in, um, in uh, weaving and uh, and sewing, and has a daughter who's a my niece is a costume designer in New York, so I think that influence came very much from my sister. Yeah. Where do you live right now? In Kingston, I've lived there since '84. Yeah. So that's truly home. So how does it feel when you come back to Saskatoon? Oh, it it, it always feels great. I love this city, and I think a city that had this. You know, this hundred-year vision through the Miwasan Valley Authority and uh, the people and, I don't know, the smell of the prairies. And, yeah, it's a, great, it's a great city. Excellent. Great people. And we're glad to have you back here. Well, thank you.